Okay, you may have noticed that this is a different room than where I normally do these lessons. Uh, I'm actually doing this in my study or office where all my books and paraphernalia are. So a little bit different, but hopefully you'll be able to hear and to see um, as we go through the lesson as well as you did when I was doing it from the dining room table. Uh, so as I said earlier, this is the 12th session of the Vital Pursuits book. It's uh, entitled Overcoming Doubt, and we're in Matthew chapter 11. So again, this is Overcoming Doubt from the Vital Pursuits book, and we're looking at Matthew chapter 11. So if this is number 12, that means we've had 11 other sessions prior to this. So real quickly, let me just mention what those topics were. We talked about initially talking to God. And we said that God would like us to talk to him because he's our father. We're his children. He likes to hear from us. Secondly was listening to God. Uh, the counterpart of us talking to God is us listening to him. And we need to be still and quiet in order to listen to God. Thirdly, we talked about the priority of a spiritual community. And why do we need a spiritual community? Because a spiritual community is an encouragement to believers in the study of God's Word, in worship, in prayer, in meeting practical needs of our membership. It is a place where we have mutual support from other believers. Fourth, we talked about worship and the difference between Old Testament worship, which was done at a distance, and New Testament worship, which is done close up. We saw the difference in the two words used for worship, one indicating to prostrate at a distance, and the other one in the New Testament, meaning to crouch close enough by that you could touch the object you're worshiping. We talked about the importance of worshiping in spirit and in truth. Session five, we talked about giving to God and how giving is an expression of our faithfulness as God's stewards and an expression of worship and gratitude for what God has done for us in the past. Session six, we talked about spending a daily time with God and the importance of doing that to help us to know who God is. Kind of refers back to the previous lesson of knowing God in truth, but it also helps us to be able to um, respond to God when he talks to us. Session seven was on uh, studying God's word and the importance of spending time studying God's word and having a plan on how to do it. Having a plan and having the right tools to do it. Uh, session number eight talked about meditating and memorizing God's word. And we talked about how the meditation is different than Eastern meditation. We're not trying to empty our minds. We're trying to fill our minds with God's word. And memorizing scriptures help us to meditate on those scriptures when we're not holding our Bibles. Session nine, we talked about applying God's word. And we talked about to do that, we have to spend time again with a plan uh, we have to have exposure, extensive exposure to God's Word. We have to continue to study it. Uh, we have to examine it and understand what it's saying to us. Session 10, we talked about living in the power of the Spirit with the emphasis that the Holy Spirit was a person, not an essence or a force, but an actual person, and that he has certain functions in a believer's life. We talked about how you have to daily engage with that spirit. And then last week, session 12, excuse me, session 11, we talked about resisting temptation. And we talked about the difference between temptation and testing. Remember, the purpose of a test is to pass, is success. The purpose of temptation is failure, a non-pass. We talked about identifying the sources of temptation, whether they be the world, the flesh, or the devil himself, and how to recognize the sequence of temptation and how to cut it off. Again, we talked about the importance of God's word 
as a way of resisting temptation and the importance of avoiding those places and situations that we know lead us into temptation. And now this week, we're going to move on to the subject of doubt and how to overcome doubt. So to start with, probably every one of us has experienced doubt in some form or fashion. Not necessarily doubt in our religious life, but we're going to come to that in a minute, but doubt. So for instance, we may have had a doubt of our ability to win a sporting event or to get a promotion at work or to get through a project. Or if you remember your school days to pass an exam in school. The bottom line is doubt is something we've all experienced and we probably still experience it today. So here's a list of some things, and I want you to think about them. And if you had to come up with two of the items I'm going to list, which would you have hopes for, but doubt will ever happen in your lifetime? So first off, will the Royals ever win another World Series? Will the Chiefs win the Super Bowl this year? Will a woman be ever elected president of the United States? Will a cure for cancer be discovered? Will there be lasting peace in the Middle East? And I could go on. There are things that we all hope for, but we doubt will ever occur in our lifetime. Well, as I said a minute ago, we're going to talk about doubt in the Bible. So to start with, those of us that think about doubt in the Bible will immediately turn to Thomas. You know, everybody has heard of doubting Thomas. And that's probably the first person that you think of when you hear doubt in the Bible. There were quite a few other very prominent doubters in both the Old and New Testament. But first off, what do we mean by doubt? The dictionary defines doubt as a feeling of uncertainty about something or a feeling of disbelief. Well, as I said earlier, doubt is as normal and predictable in our everyday lives as it is in our spiritual lives. The Bible calls us to believe and to follow the commands of a God who we've never seen face to face. You know, having a little doubt about that probably would not be unexpected. So today's session, we look at three things that deal with biblical doubt. The first is doubting who God is. Secondly, doubting his plan. And thirdly, doubting his power to fulfill his plan. So let's start with our scripture verse. And we're going to talk about one of those doubters that you may have not thought about as a doubter. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 to 6. And this is the story of John the Baptist while he is in prison. So let's read it from the New International Version, and then we'll read it from the Holman Version, and we'll talk from there. So this is Matthew chapter 11, verses um, 2 through 6. New International. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you have, what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, Deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Let's look at it from the Holman version. Starting at verse 2. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent a message to him by his disciples. Well, we know the story of why John is in prison. He called the king out for marrying his brother's wife. So John's in prison. His ministry is over. 
it is now time for Jesus to pick up the baton and to continue the ministry of the Messiah. And John is sending a message, and he's sending it by his disciples. And the message basically is going to be, are you the one we're looking for? So notice, he sent a message by his disciples, verse 3, and asked him, are you the one who is coming, or should we expect someone else? John's beginning to ask, what if? What if I was wrong? What if this is not the Messiah? Remember, John has baptized Jesus. He has indicated that he is the one that's to come after him, that he's the forerunner for. But the words that come into John do not describe what they are expecting in the way of a Messiah. He's not fulfilling the job description of the Messiah that John and most Israelites were expecting. So he's asking, if you're the king, if you're the Messiah, and I was your forerunner, how come I'm in prison and people are opposing you? You are the one who is going to redeem Israel. Why is this happening to me and why is this happening to you? Notice Jesus' answer. Jesus replied to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind see, see, the lame walk, those with skin diseases are healed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news. And if anyone is not offended because of me, he is blessed. Now, for those of you that are in our New Horizons class, we just finished a whole session on the book of Isaiah. The verses or the statements that Jesus is making here basically comes directly out of the Messianic prophecies of Isaiah. So when he talks about the blind and the lame and the deaf, he's basically quoting from Isaiah 35. When he talks about the dead being raised, he's quoting from Isaiah 26. And preaching the good news to the poor, that's Isaiah 61. All of these are Messianic prophecies. So Jesus is saying to John's disciples, he doesn't say to them, yes, I'm the Messiah. He says to them, go back to John and tell him what you hear me say and what you see. I'm fulfilling all the messianic prophecies. I'm doing it with supernatural power. So therefore, he doesn't say it, but he's basically saying, therefore, I am the Messiah. I'm doing what the Messiah was called to do. It's not what you expected him to do, but it's what Isaiah prophesied that the Messiah would do. So let's look at at doubt now. That gives you the background of a doubter, John the Baptist. Maybe that's somebody that you thought about as a doubter, but a doubter in, in itself. I'm going to quote a couple of American authors, religious authors. One if is, is a writer named Frederick Berkner, who wrote, whether your faith is that there is a God or that there is not a God, if you don't have doubts, you're either kidding yourself or asleep. Doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. They keep it awake or moving. So if you're a believer or if you're an atheist and you've never had doubts about your belief, because atheism for me is a belief, if you have never had doubts about your beliefs, then you're kidding yourselves or you're asleep. You haven't thought about it deep enough. Philip Yancey, which many of us may have heard of, Another religious writer writes, God's invisibility guarantees I will experience times of doubt. Now, I said earlier that the Bible is full of doubters. We always think of doubting Thomas. But there were other doubters. For instance, let's look at some of them. Go back to the Old Testament. Moses was a doubter. Remember what he said to God at the burning bush? Basically, he said, Pharaoh's not going to listen to me. 
Why are you sending me? I can't do this job. Later on, when they are in the promised land, we have Gideon. And remember, Gideon was called to lead the Israelite army to attack another nation's army. And what did Gideon say? I can't do this. The Israelites aren't going to follow me. I'm not a warrior leader. How about Lot's wife? Go further back. Lot's wife. Will one tiny look back make a difference? Let's jump to the New Testament. Peter. Will I be able to walk on water? Remember what happened when he doubted? And then, of course, the one we all think of, Doubting Thomas. Did Jesus really rise from the dead? So I said we're going to look at three parts of doubts. First was the doubt of who God is. And then we'll look at his plan and his power. So when we talk about doubts about God's identity, we're talking about is there a God and does he care? That's basically what we're looking at with God's identity. Because for Christians, we think of God as a compassionate, loving God. And when we see things that don't fit that, then maybe we doubt God's identity or the fact that he loves us. For instance, there's, I think there was a book written. I'm sure I've heard sermons on this. Why do bad things happen to good people? When there is a senseless tragedy like a school shooting. When there's a child that's laid up in a hospital because of some debilitating uh, illness. Or some type of gross misjustice. Senseless tragedies can make us doubt that there is an all-powerful and loving God. It makes us, like John, ask the what if questions. What if God is loving? How can he let this happen? Bad things happen to good people. Why? If God is loving, if he wants to take care of his um, believers, why? Do bad things happen to good people? How do we overcome that doubt? Well, think back to the session that we had about studying God's Word and worship. When we talked about worship, we talked about the need to worship in spirit and in truth. And the idea behind truth was that we need to know the God that we're worshiping. And then we talked about studying God's word and meditating and memorizing it. We said that the necessity of this was so that we would have an intimate relationship with God. It's not just head knowledge. It's not just reading a piece of scripture and glossing over it and letting it go. We need to understand what God has done in the past, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We need to think about what God has done in our past and have the confidence that he will take care of us as he has done in the past, in the present, and as he will in the future. So if we accept the fact and we get over the doubt of God's identity, he is and he has compassion on his followers, then the second type of doubt is a doubt of his plan. When we talk about doubts about God's plan, it generally focuses on two things. First, God is the designer of the plan. And secondly, God is the manager of the plan. So, God is the manager of the plan. God, your plan is wrong. It's flawed. Think of John's question to Jesus. Are you the one we were looking for? The plan we were looking for was a political Messiah, one who was going to free Israel from its oppression and reestablish the Israelite kingdom and eventually rule the world. So what you're doing 
doesn't fit the plan we were looking for. So the plan's got to be flawed. Secondly, we can talk about how God is executing his plan. Your leadership is flawed. You're not doing it right. Well, most of the times, that issue becomes an issue of timing. We can be very impatient with God. We can think, the opportunity is now, God. I can see it. I see what needs to be done. We need to act now. And God says, whoa, hold down. Wait. That's not what we're looking for. We're going, it's time. We need to do it now. Or secondly, it's a matter of um, if we don't do it now, we're not going to be able to do it. The opportunity will be lost. And again, God says, whoa, slow down. Let's do it in my timing, not your timing. You know, we see the opportunity. We see the urgency. We don't necessarily see all the factors involved. We don't see, if you will, the big picture. God does. We need to not be impatient. We need not to doubt God's plan or his timing because he's designed it from the beginning and he will execute it flawlessly in his timing. The third thing, third type of doubt, is a doubt about God's power. And this is kind of related to the execution of God's plan. It's God doesn't have the power to do what he said he was going to do. Okay, Again, go back to John the Baptist in prison. He's basically asking Jesus, if you're the Messiah, why aren't you taking over? Why aren't you throwing out the Romans? Why aren't you establishing the kingdom? Do you not have the power to do this? And look at what Jesus does. He listed all of the supernatural things he was doing. Healing the sick, giving blind their sight, giving the deaf their hearing, letting the lame walk, raising the dead. All of those things are supernatural. So he's demonstrating to John, I have the power. So don't doubt me. I have the power to do it, but I'm doing it according to my plan. Not the plan of the Israelites. Maybe not the plan of John the Baptist. But I'm doing it in accordance with my plan and my father's plan. And we will do it in his time frame. So how do we handle those doubts? Well, here are some suggested ways to overcome and confront doubts when they occur to us. The first thing is pretty obvious, I think. We need to identify what kind of doubt we have. Is the doubt that we're having a doubt that God exists or doesn't exist? Are we doubting his very existence? Secondly, are we doubting his character? Are we doubting that he is a compassionate, loving God who wants the best for his followers? Thirdly, are we doubting his plan? His plan is not flawed. His plan is perfect. Are we doubting the plan? Fourth, are we doubting where he's leading? It may not be where we think it should go, but again, we don't necessarily see every avenue that's out there. So are we doubting where God is leading? And lastly, number five, are we doubting his power? Are we saying God doesn't have the ability to accomplish what he's set out to do? After you have identified the doubt, the second thing to do is to admit to God that you have doubts and ask for his help in confronting them. There's a story in the Bible 
where a man brings uh, his son to Jesus and asks Jesus to heal him. And Jesus said, do you believe that I can do this? And the man says, yes, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Jesus didn't ask him for unwavering, uh, total, absolute, 100%, no doubt belief. The man acknowledged he had belief, but he needed help with his doubt. We're likewise. We need to admit to God that we do have doubts at times. And when we have doubts, we need to ask for help. So, where do you go for help? Well, how many times have we talked about God's Word? You go to God's Word when you're confronted with doubt. Can you see a theme that's gone through all of these lessons? It all seems to circle back to the Bible. It all seems to circle back for meditation, for memory, for study, for worship. All of that seems to revolve around the idea of you need to know your Bible. Fourthly, we need to claim the promises of God. There are lots of promises in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. We need to claim those promises whenever we have doubts. And probably most important, it's listed last, but I'd almost say it's one of the most important parts of this, is to remember when we've had victories in the past over doubts. Remember that God has been faithful in the past and he will be faithful in the future. So, as we come to the end of the session today, just remember, doubts are normal. Doubts are predictable. If you don't have doubts, you're probably kidding yourself. But just remember, God's there, and he's there to help you to overcome those doubts and to lead you in a fuller, um, more productive life as a follower of him. So let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day. I thank you for this lesson about doubt. And I thank you for helping us to recognize that doubt's normal. We're not any less of a believer because we have doubts. Help us to identify our doubts. Help us to come to you and ask for your help in overcoming those doubts. And help us to remember the victories that we've had in the past because of you. Now, as we close tonight, I pray again for our church as we look forward to a new pastor coming. And I pray for services on Sundays that things will go well. For we ask it in your name. Amen.